Today on the show, we're going to be talking about my arcade cabinet. Over the course of the last few years, I've gotten, I would say, regular requests to do a video about this. For all I know, it's the same couple of guys asking, uh, but hey, that's what I'm here for. Uh, so this cabinet is a Sega Astro City cabinet. Uh, it's a Japanese candy cabinet. And uh, this is going to be kind of a lot of information to unpack. So I'm going to try to do it in a way that, uh, that makes sense. But uh, so I guess the story kind of starts with JAMA. And uh, JAMA is this organization in Japan. Uh, JAMA stands for Japanese Amusement Machine and Marketing Association, I think. So that kind of tells you what they do. Uh, but one of the things they did back in the 80s is they got together and they designed a, I guess you'd call it a wiring standard for uh, arcade machines, uh, Japanese arcade machines. But, you know, because most arcade games were coming out of Japan, uh, it just sort of became the standard here, too, because we were were playing their games, more or less. So uh, what that means is that uh, every uh, arcade game that follows the JAMA standard, which was the vast majority of them, had uh, the same pinouts on the, the board itself. And, and I'll show you what, what I kind of mean by that later when we look at an arcade board. But uh, basically, it just means that the wiring for the controls, the video, the audio, uh, the coin mechanism, the power, that was all completely standardized and, and that all those cabinets would be wired up the same way. And I think that was really done more with uh, sort of Japanese arcades uh, in mind. Uh, here in the US, I feel like it was far more common to see dedicated arcade machines, meaning like that is a Street Fighter II machine, or that's an elevator action machine, or a Pac-Man machine, or, or whatever, although Pac-Man predates the JAMA standard, uh, obviously. But uh, in Japan, it was a little bit different in that once they, seemingly once they got together and created this JAMA standard, arcade companies started selling uh, what I guess you would call multi-purpose arcade cabinets, meaning that this is an arcade cabinet like Sega, you know, Sega built the Astro City behind me. Sega just made arcade cabinets and you could just buy the cabinet, you as an arcade operator, and then you could buy whatever game you wanted from any company and stick it in there. So if you were to go into a, a Japanese arcade in like the 90s or really still today, you're just going to see like rows and rows of these multi-purpose sort of generic, if you want to call them that. Uh, arcade machines that the operators would just throw whatever board uh, they wanted to in. And uh, I would say probably the three biggest manufacturers of, of these this type of arcade machine in Japan, Sega, I think, was the biggest. Like if you look, I mean, in like sheer numbers, uh, if you just go on like Google Images and look uh, at pictures of Japanese arcade, uh, Japanese arcades, you're going to mostly see Sega cabinets. But you also see a lot of Taito cabinets, specifically the Taito Egret 2, which I would say is probably the most sought after Japanese uh, arcade cabinet. And then uh, Konami had uh, the Windy cabinet was a was a fairly popular one. Now, both Konami and Taito made lots of other cabinets. I'm just using those uh, as an example uh, and Sega as well. This is actually the second uh, sort of upright, if you want to call it that, uh, multi-purpose JAMA cabinet that uh, that Sega made. The first one was the Aero City. Uh, I don't know what's with the whole city thing. That one was like all metal. It looked a lot more boxy. That one came out in uh, 1988 and had a cocktail cabinet analog called the Aero Table. And uh, so that was like a cocktail cabinet, like, you know, was fairly common to see back in the day, except that it was just a JAMA cabinet. So you could throw, uh, you know, whatever game you as an arcade operator, again, could throw whatever game you wanted uh, uh, in there. Uh, the Astro City is an upgrade uh, over the Aero City. This came out in 1993, by the way. Uh, this one's got a monitor that's three inches larger. So that that's like the biggest upgrade. Uh, after that, you had the Astro City 2 which is very rare. I've never uh, seen one, and there's really not that many pictures of them online. Uh, far more common was the new Astro City, which looks almost identical to the Astro City. Uh, the speakers are sticking out. I think they must just be bigger speakers. Uh, after the new Astro City, you had the Blast City, 
which again looks kind of similar. Uh, same size monitor, but it was a tri-sync monitor. And uh, they moved the speakers down so that they were on either side uh, of the monitor. So, uh, so that's pretty cool. Those are pretty common. Uh, I've had this cabinet for, I think, about three years. Uh, I got what I consider to be a pretty amazing deal uh, on it. I, it was, I got it off of the forums. Uh, somebody basically posted somebody that was relatively local to me, like a two hour drive away, uh, posted on the forums that they had this arcade cabinet and they needed it gone, like within like the next few days. I don't know if the guy was moving. Uh, I mean, he was a regular forum member, so this wasn't some kind of weird shady deal. And when I got to his house, he did have other cabinets. So it's not, you know, nothing about it seemed shady. I'm saying, I don't know why he wanted it gone now. And he only wanted 450 bucks for it, which I understand 450 bucks is a lot of money, but normally uh, an Astro City cabinet, even in the condition that I bought it in, uh, is about a thousand dollars. So 450 is, uh, is pretty good. Now, you know, you'll see as we kind of move over there and, and take a look at the cabinet, it's certainly not in perfect condition. Uh, it's kind of the way I like it. It still has all of its battle scars. Uh, a lot of people, they buy these cabinets and they want to restore them to, you know, they want them to be like factory pristine. And I totally get that. It's just kind of not what I want. Like this cabinet spent years and years, uh, I'm sure in a Japanese arcade somewhere. And, you know, it's kind of got the scars to show it. And I mean, I think that makes it kind of cool. It's kind of like, you know, people like to use the word patina now. So maybe it has like patina. Uh, I don't really know. Um, I have put a lot of like, you know, sweat equity, if you want to call it, uh, into it. The, the cabinet was really filthy. Uh, I had to replace like like all the screws were rusty, but like big deal. I made a list of the screws and went down to the uh, the hardware store and bought a bunch of new ones. But I mean, it was just really filthy, dirty. I had to take it apart and clean all the crevices out. Uh, I, I did do actually a lot of rewiring, some of the power wiring in there. Uh, I don't know what somebody was doing in there, but uh, it was not really safe. So I kind of restored the wiring to the way that it should be uh, for, for safety reasons. Um, Oh, like the, the control panel, uh, I think everything was white, if I remember correctly. Well, the ball tops, I think, were black, but like all the buttons were white. Now they're the original color that they should be. One of the things we're going to do today is, uh, I don't want to use the word upgrade, but uh, when I got the cabinet, it still had the original arcade sticks uh, in it. And uh, those uh, are, in this case, Saimitsu uh, is the brand. They're Saimitsu LS56. And uh, I'm going to change those out. Uh, well, I've already changed one out, uh, just so you don't have to watch me do it twice. But we're going to change the other one out, and I'm putting uh, Sanwa JLF sticks in it. But that's just personal preference. I mean, those are both – both of those companies are – they're like the two premier uh, arcade control uh, manufacturers uh, in, in Asia. So uh, you can't go wrong with either one of them. We're going to throw the stick in the machine, and then once that's done, uh, we're going to fire up some games and uh, and check it out. And I'm also going to give just sort of a really brief tour of uh, of the cabinet so you can kind of see uh, how it works and uh, what goes where. So uh, now first thing we're going to do is uh, get this joystick ready to uh, go in the cabinet. So one thing I wanted to quickly mention before we get to the joystick are dynamo cabinets. I mentioned in the intro that uh, these multi-purpose JAMA cabinets were, were more of a Japanese thing. And that's really only true uh, on a superficial level. And what I mean by that is that if you walked into an American arcade, you know, sometime in the 90s, you were going to see a lot of these six foot tall black cabinets that all had uh, lit up marquees and uh, control panel artwork, side panel artwork, maybe even bezel artwork that was specific to the game so that you would look at that cabinet and say, oh, that's a, a Golden Axe cabinet. But there was actually this company here in the US called Dynamo that made a lot of those cabinets and they are actually multi-purpose JAMA cabinets. They had a, a drawer that you could pull out that the PCB would sit on and you could actually even rotate the monitor in them. The difference is that in Japan, these cabinets really prominently displayed uh, the branding of the cabinet maker. So in this case, it's a Sega Astro City. Whereas here in the US, you didn't look at a Dynamo cabinet and say, oh, that's a Dynamo cabinet, unless you're really into arcade games, because it might just have a little plate 
somewhere sort of hidden away that said Dynamo on it. And as an American arcade operator, when you bought a game, maybe you wanted to swap out the game in your Dynamo cabinet. When you bought a new one, you didn't just get the PCB, you got new gigantic stickers for the side panels, maybe a new sticker, a big sticker for uh, the control panel, obviously a new marquee, and again, sometimes even uh, uh, bezel artwork to go around the monitor. So it was much different than in Japan, where really all you would have is the game running on the machine and maybe uh, a move strip or an instruction sheet uh, up on the marquee, and that's it. So uh, I didn't want to not mention Dynamo, uh, just because they're a really important part, actually, of American arcade history. So now let's move over to the desk and get the joystick ready for installation. All right, so let's do up the joystick real quick. I have the old player one joystick here, uh, just so we can kind of check it out. And then uh, here obviously is the new joystick uh, along with the parts that we are going to, uh, to install. So if you've never seen an arcade joystick, uh, at least on the inside, uh, this is the part that you would normally see uh, sticking out. Normally, obviously there would be some kind of top uh, on here, either a round ball or a, a bat top which is more uh, oblong. And uh, under here, uh, this white part is called the gate. And uh, whatever the hole is that sort of cut in the middle of the gate is what dictates uh, the way that the joystick can move around. So I'll move it a little bit closer here and hopefully it will focus. There we go. Uh, so this is called a square gate. And uh, that is because you can basically move the joystick around in a square. So like if that's up, down, left and right, because the joystick is upside down, uh, you know, if you wanted to say, uh, you know, throw a fireball in Street Fighter 2, you know, you'd, you'd roll it off like that, uh, you know, down, diagonal, forward. Uh, the reason I don't like square gates is because when you're doing a move like that, it's too easy to accidentally go up a little bit too high and, you know, and hit up. And then of course, you know, your character is gonna jump. And, you know, somebody out there will tell me, oh, well, you just need to get good. But uh, I'd rather just use a gate that is more comfortable for me. Um, some games will use a square gate, but it'll be turned uh, 45 degrees like Pac-Man uh, so that the corners are, are at the four directions uh, to make it easier for you to, because you're only moving up, down, left, right uh, in Pac-Man. Obviously there's no diagonals, um, but that's not the case uh, here. A square gate is the most common gate, by the way. It's just the one that I happen to like uh, the least. They make round gates, which I think would even be better than a square gate for playing something like a fighting game, but they also make uh, octagonal gates and hopefully we can get it to focus there. Uh, and that's what the, th what this is. And as we put it in, uh, I'll show you. Uh, I'm also gonna put in a heavier spring and a larger actuator. And I will show you what those mean. So uh, now we're done with the Saimitsu LS56 and we can focus on uh, our Sanwa here. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna pop off the gate. Now you see this gate looks a little bit different. Uh, just It's made out of clear plastic, but it's not screwed in like it is on uh, the Saimitsu, it's just held on with these four clips. So all we have to do is uh, try to carefully bend in the clips without breaking anything. There we go. Okay, so that's the gate, that's the square gate, which we don't need anymore, but it's perfectly good, so I'm not gonna throw it out or anything. I'll just put it in my container of uh, arcade parts. And really the gate is what's holding a lot of the stick together because now we can pop this uh, out and uh, and this just shows you, is that focusing okay? Hopefully. Uh, anyway, so you see all it really is is four micro switches. Uh, and what the actuator does is it hits those switches uh, as you move uh, the stick around. Now we're not gonna do anything with this part, so I'm gonna set that aside. So here is uh, what's left of the joystick. You can see you got the shaft here. And of course now it doesn't click when I move it around because there's no micro switches anymore. Uh, but what you have, this piece, this big uh, piece of black plastic here is called the actuator. And the top part of the actuator, the sort of the thinner part 
uh, up here is uh, what pushes up against the gate. And then you see it kind of flares out down here. And that's the part that actually hits the micro switches. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put an actuator in here where the top part is wider. And what that's gonna do is make it a slightly shorter throw uh, joystick, which, uh, which I like better. The other thing we're gonna do is we're gonna change the spring that is sort of, you're not gonna be able to see it. It's sort of inside uh, the actuator. This has a one pound spring. We're gonna put a two pound spring and that just sort of dictates the force with which uh, the joystick wants to center itself. So what that means in a practical sense uh, is that the joystick is gonna feel uh, heavier, which, uh, you know, which I prefer. So uh, all we have to do, the only tool we need for this is I'm gonna use a flathead screwdriver. There's a snap ring uh, here at the top that is holding the joystick together. Uh, they probably make uh, a special tool for this, but I don't have it. So uh, I just use a little flathead screwdriver. There we got that off. And so now uh, the spring is gonna wanna sort of force the actuator up. So actuator out, spring out. And then we're gonna be careful with this because it's covered in grease, which I do not want all over my cork mat. Get these out of the way here. Okay. New spring, new actuator. Trying to get the snap ring back on with my bare hands. All right, there we go. All right, so see how easy that was? And now, I mean, you can't tell, but just take my word for it that uh, this thing feels like way heavier now, uh, which like I said, I think, I think feels better. So now we just need to put the micro switch board back in and then we are going to put our new gate on and that gate goes this way that's it so here's the control panel this is the two player six button version you could also get this in a two player three button version or you can get it in a one player version that would just have the controls in the middle. Sega also actually used the same uh, color scheme and same control panel artwork for the Japanese version of the Virtua Stick, which was the official arcade stick uh, in Japan for the Sega Saturn. And I believe the reason for that is that Virtua Fighter was sold uh, as an arcade game uh, in Sega Astro City Cabinet. So it was sort of uh, a product tie-in for the Saturn back to the arcades. There's only six screws holding this whole panel on, uh, and that's done to make it easy to remove the control panel because depending on what game you were running, the operator would want to change the control panel to something else. There were quite a few specialty control panels that came out. Uh, there was one that had uh, like a trackball or two trackballs in it two spinner knobs. Uh, there was a monkey ball uh, arcade game that had a control panel with it that had like a big banana in the middle. I mentioned that uh, the Blast City that came to North America was a bass fishing cabinet, and that one actually has a fishing controller built into it. And then there's also like some kind of crazy mahjong uh, control panel uh, that was obviously only made available in, uh, in Asia. So... Uh, Nothing really much else to say, I guess, about the outside of the control panel. You can see over there, uh, right there, is the uh, coin slot, and it's a 100 yen uh, uh, coin is what it takes, which is about $1, which is pretty expensive. I'll show you the coin mechanism uh, a little bit later. For now, we're going to go ahead and open the control panel, change out that player two joystick, put the button dampers into those six buttons right there, and then we're actually going to change out the player two controller harness, which uh, you'll see what that means and while we're doing it, uh, once I get it cracked open. So normally the control panel would be locked uh, for obvious reasons. There's two locks underneath the control panel, but you know, this is for home use, right? So uh, I don't really care about that kind of stuff. So I don't have uh, the locks actually installed. So all we have to do is lift up and the control panel 
opens right up. So uh, that makes things easy. So just for a quick tour uh, to see, you know, what's going on in here, uh, you've got some connectors back here. These are called amp up connectors. Uh, I can show you an example here because we're going to put in a new controller harness. Uh, an amp up connector. I don't know. This this is a, a twelve pin uh, connector. It's not the kind of connector that you can just run down to Ace Hardware uh, and buy, which uh, might explain what's going on in here. Uh, you can see that over here, things look nice. We've got the brand new joystick uh, installed. And just in general, I would say that the wiring looks fairly neat. Whereas on the player two side, we've still got the old joystick, but we've also just got uh, this rat's nest uh, of wires in here. So um, why don't we actually go ahead and just pull that out first? because it'll just make it easier to talk about uh, what's going on in here. Okay, so uh, now we've got that uh, horrible abomination out of here. Um, these, uh, all these connectors up front, uh, this connector is, uh, this runs up the side uh, of the monitor here and uh, this powers the, uh, the marquee at the top and I believe it also carries the audio signals to the speakers. Uh, this is obviously the player one harness. We just took out the player two harness. The extra button harness goes in uh, this spot, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. You need to use that for games like uh, Street Fighter II or Mortal Kombat, uh, or things that use more than four buttons. And then this last connector over here, I don't really know what the application would be for that. Uh, it just has a ground wire coming out of the back, so who knows. Uh, and then I don't know if you can see the board uh, under here. There's a monitor remote board here that has all the controls for the monitor on it so that you can adjust contrast, brightness. You can in individually adjust the gain of the R, G, and B, uh, the red, green, and blue signals. And uh, you can make some basic uh, geometry uh, adjustments. So, uh, so anyway, the first thing we're gonna do here is we're gonna take out uh, this arcade uh, stick so that we can put in uh, the new stick. So now we've got the stick out. You can see it looks just like the other stick. It's a Saimitsu LS56. So we need to put in the new stick and uh, that's gonna require some longer screws. Okay, so now I got my screws out and uh, I put a lock washer on each one uh, just to hold it in place. So we've got the new uh, stick in place with its uh, octagonal gate so that it's got eight corners instead of four. And the next thing we wanna do is we wanna put in the button dampers. So. I wanna kinda of show you why we would want those. So uh, this is what the buttons sound like stock. You can see I'm not, I'm not pressing them uh, particularly hard. Whereas over on the other side, uh, I've put in the button dampers over here. It still makes noise. I mean, this is a big hollow cabinet made out of resin, so uh, it's never gonna be silent, but uh, it's a lot quieter, but it also feels a lot better because there's a little bit of cushion uh, when the button bottoms out. I'm gonna do up all six of these real quick and zoom ahead because no one really needs to see that. Okay, so we've got uh, all six of the button dampers in, we've got the new joystick in, so now we need to put in the new uh, player two button harness, which I have over here someplace. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so uh, this is, um, I don't know, I forgot where I got this, I bought it from somebody. This is still a an original part. 
And uh, so we just need to uh, install it. And then after it's installed, uh, I do have some zip ties here. So if there are some ways to clean up the wiring, uh, we will go ahead and do that. So first, we do plug this in. We're going to plug it in. Go ahead and plug both of these now underneath this. We're going to call sort of wire tie thing. There's another wire tie here. Now we're going to use it. But uh, first, we plug the joystick in like that. And um, we'll actually put that probably in there. Uh, and then I've already gone through here and labeled all of these uh, to make it easier. These are just push on connectors, uh, which is very handy because sometimes you wanna change which button does what. Uh, like if I'm playing Neo Geo, I want button one, two, three, and four to be different than if I'm playing like Street Fighter two or something. So I've got this one labeled 2PS for two player start. And uh, that's what this yellow button over here is for. So push those on, right? And then we're just gonna go around here. Leave the blue button one on there. Try to get this situation here. Okay. Uh, blue one button one, which I'm going to use this guy's button one. Green is button two. Yellow button one is button three. I guess I'll have to just poke it through right here. Okay, so that's done, but you can certainly see that the wiring over here is not as nice uh, as it is over there. But um, that's not a problem because what we're going to do is. Uh, do some zip tying here, creative zip tying. But you know, we try to do it in a way where uh, it will look neat. I mean, it's not gonna to get too much better than that. So uh, theoretically, uh, this should be working now. So uh, we are going to test it out and uh, make sure everything's working. Uh, then I'm just gonna kinda of maybe, I'll just give you a little overview of the cabinet, uh, the underside, and we can check out the marquee. Uh, and then we're gonna play some games. So I'm gonna show you uh, show you how to change a game. Uh, we're gonna pop Street Fighter Two in there. So I'm gonna show you how the extra button harness works. Uh, so uh, still kind of a long way to go here, so uh, let's get going. All right, so now just to uh, show you that the Player 2 harness is working, uh, I've booted up my arcade cabinet with a Neo Geo board uh, in there, and then I hit the test button inside the cabinet so that I could access this hardware test. So what you're gonna see, here's Player 1, Player 2, and these zeros will turn into ones when uh, I press the corresponding uh, button or direction. So over here on the player one side, I'm going up, down, left, right, and then button A, B, C, D. But moving over to player two, now you're gonna keep an eye on this column, uh, up, down, left, right, A, B, C, D, and then here I can press start and it doesn't do anything. But uh, point is that uh, the little uh, modification or improvement that we made over on the player two side was a success. Uh, so just really quickly, we'll take a look at uh, sort of the upper part of the arcade cabinet here. I guess you'd call it like the marquee area. Uh, again, these Japanese candy cabinets don't uh, take marquees like these that I have on the wall. Uh, rather, what this cabinet would have originally had is sort of this uh, acrylic thing that would be screwed to the back of the cabinet and would come up back here, and it would have like a flyer or an instruction sheet in it that uh, would tell people what game uh, is running in the cabinet, uh, as if they couldn't already tell just looking at the screen. Uh, and then again, just to sort of highlight the difference between this Astro City and a new Astro City, uh, here on each side of, uh, you know, I, I refer to this as the marquee, and then for some reason they want you to know that that's an aerodynamic shape. I don't know what that really has to do with anything. Uh, and then it says flat square 29 because it's referring to the size uh, of the monitor and the fact that it's relatively flat for a CRT. But uh, anyway, uh, you probably can't tell because it's a little bit dark, but there's a speaker grill right here and right here. And so these speakers are actually kind of pointed up this way, which is, I guess, probably a little bit suboptimal and is maybe part of the reason they changed it with the new Astro City. So with that cabinet, you, you have like these white boxes that sort of protrude out right here and here. 
and those point the the speakers more uh, straight ahead. But uh, yeah, that's pretty much all that's going up, uh, going on rather uh, up here. All right, moving down the front of the cabinet, here is obviously the monitor. As I already said, it's a 29 inch monitor, which is a little bit bigger than the Aero City. Uh, 29 inches is actually pretty big, I would say, uh, for an arcade monitor, considering how close uh, your face is to the screen. Uh, if I had my face that close to our living room TV when I was a kid, uh, I probably would have gotten yelled at by my parents. But uh, anyway, just the two things I wanted to bring up about the monitor. First of all, it is rotatable, uh, as are the monitors in any candy cabinet uh, uh, I know about. Uh, it is a two-person job, but I wouldn't call it that difficult. You just take the front half of the top of the cabinet off, and then there are four nuts to, to undo. And then it takes two people because you actually have to lift the monitor out rotate it 90 degrees, and then hang it back on the same uh, four bolts that are sticking out. And then this black bezel is actually attached to the cabinet shell, and you just unscrew it and uh, obviously rotate it as well. <clears throat> uh, the one other thing I wanted to say, I mentioned earlier there were still a couple of things about the cabinet that I would like to work on, and one of them is that I would like to get the monitor supporting electronics, which is called the monitor chassis, uh, I'd, ha I'd like to have the capacitors replaced. Uh, you can see that, or hopefully you can see, that the monitor is very sharp and the colors are quite vivid, but uh, it's got some geometry issues that uh, I think need to be sorted out. Luckily, the tube itself is in excellent condition. Uh, aside from just some surface imperfections on the glass, there is no burn-in uh, on the screen, which is, of course, uh, not repairable. So that does it for the monitor. So now we're gonna move down below the control panel and check out the inside of the cabinet. Here's the front of the lower half of the cabinet. And you can see that this is where the cabinet shows most of its wear and tear. Understandably, this is where people's legs and feet would be. This is where they might be uh, banging stools up into it, throwing their backpacks up against it, spilling their drinks on it. So while a lot of that stuff looks like it might just wipe off or scrub off, Unfortunately, those are just imperfections in the paint, and there's really no way to fix them without just repainting the cabinet, or at least trying to touch it up, which in my opinion, never turns out looking that good. So now we've got the doors open. Uh, unfortunately, I can't really point to things because I'm actually sitting behind the camera, but uh, hopefully this is okay. So now on the left, you can see uh, all the way in the back is where the power comes into the cabinet, and it actually also has an outlet back there. And uh, the reason for that is so that you could uh, like daisy chain several of the cabinets together. And then uh, kind of below that panel and in front of it, you see that gray box sitting on the floor of the cabinet. So uh, that's the power supply. And then the test and service buttons, as well as a monitor degaussing or degaussing or whatever button are on the front. Those are those red buttons if you can see them. And then to the right of that is the arcade PCB, which uh, hopefully you can tell uh, that's actually a piece of plywood in there. And uh, that's the way you're supposed to, uh, I guess you could probably buy a plastic one if you wanted to, but uh, they were meant to just be used with a piece of plywood. You can see that piece of plywood is kind of leaning over a little bit. And that's because being that this is a Japanese arcade cabinet, it uh, is meant to hold a piece of plywood that has some, uh, you know, metric thickness instead of standard, but it's, you know, it's a little bit loose, so it's just uh, leaning over just a little bit, but uh, there's no danger of it actually falling over. And then uh, I've got a one slot Neo Geo board uh, in there with uh, 2020 Super Baseball in it. So uh, if I wanted to just change the game uh, to a different Neo Geo game, uh, I would just obviously power off the cabinet, and then I could just reach in there and pull that cartridge out and slide a new one in and turn it back on. So that would be easy. Uh, if I wanted to actually change the board, then uh, I would have to undo or, or pull off the jamma loom, which is that big bundle of wires that you see hanging off the front of the PCB. That's just a card edge connector, so it just slides right off, uh, no problem. And then you can just slide that whole uh, uh, piece of plywood out and uh, unscrew the board, and I'll, I'll show that more in just a minute. And then over on the right, you can see on top, uh, there's the coin mechanism. That's just a drop-in coin mechanism. You can actually lift it out of there without even using any tools. And I could just buy 
a coin mechanism to stick in there that was sized for uh, quarters, you know, American quarters. But, uh, you know, I already have quite a few hundred yen coins, and I just think it's kind of neat that uh, that the cabinet takes Japanese coins. And so I don't really have uh, any interest in changing it. And then down below, you can see so that that big white plastic box, that's the coin bucket. So, you know, you, you put in a coin up on the slot that's up on the control panel and it falls through the coin mechanism. It'll get rejected. Uh, if it's too small, it'll just go straight out into the um, coin return chute. If it's too big, it'll kind of get caught. And then you just have to push the coin return button. But uh, if it's exactly the right size, it'll fall all the way through the coin mechanism and it'll trigger it to give you one credit. And then the coin just falls into that white bucket. And that white bucket's probably about 10 inches deep. And uh, I don't know, maybe like six inches wide. And uh, so, I mean, like I said, it can hold a lot of coins. And then I don't know if you can see, but right to the, to the left of the coin bucket is uh, a coin counter. It says a coin meter. And every time you uh, put a coin in there, uh, that's a little meter that just, you know, ticks up by one. And the reading on that coin meter right now is 111,301. So that gives you maybe some kind of idea of how much money there was to be made uh, having one of these cabinets set up in, uh, in, an, ar in an arcade in Japan. Uh, remember, one coin is about one dollar. So, you know, even if you say that that half of those came from after somebody had this cabinet sitting in their house, you know, that would still be fifty five thousand dollars. So um, so these things were definitely money spinners. So, uh, like I said, now we'll we'll slide the board out real quick and uh, so you can get a closer look at it and I'll kind of explain how you would change it, although it's uh, pretty self-explanatory. All right. So now I've got the board slid out of the cabinet. And as you can see, it really is just a plain Jane piece of plywood. Uh, the board is, uh, well, the, the arcade board, I should say, is attached to the plywood with uh, these PCB feet, which, I mean, you can get those anywhere. Those are not some kind of special arcade part. And uh, so I just have a set of these feet on all of my arcade PCBs. Uh, I should mention, uh, so this is a one slot uh, Neo Geo board. Most Neo Geo boards are not JAMA compatible. So, you know, if you want to stick a Neo Geo board into an arcade cabinet, you either have to make sure you get one that is JAMA compatible or you'd have to buy an adapter board. I don't know if you can see, but it actually says right next to the card edge connector here, it says JAMA, just so that you know. Uh, this is the JAMA connector. And again, that has everything you need in it. So it's got uh, power, audio, video, controls, uh, so literally all you do is screw this PCB onto this board, push that connector on, and then just take the entire board and slide it into the arcade cabinet, and uh, you're all done. So, uh, you know, we will be playing a few different arcade PCBs. I'm not going to show how to change it, because I think I just explained it to you. I'm just going to unscrew the four wood screws, lift this one off, put a different one on, and uh, hook everything back up. I guess the one thing that I can explain if you'll uh, pardon my reach here, is uh, this other connector right here that isn't really behaving. But if I go like that, there we go. Uh, so I mentioned when we looked at the control panel, I mentioned the extra button uh, where you would, you would plug in the extra button harness. And this is literally just the other side uh, of that socket. So when I put Street Fighter II in here, uh, I made a little adapter where one end plugs in to the extra button pins on the Street Fighter II board, and the other end will just plug into this. And then we'll, we'll have to also go ahead and install the extra button harness in the control panel, which, uh, you know, is like a, you know, 90 second job or something. So, uh, so no big deal at all. So uh, now I'm gonna go ahead and get the arcade cabinet here buttoned back up, and we are going to finally play some games. All right, so what I figure we'll do is play like a half a dozen games and play each game like one credit each so that this doesn't, you know, go on forever. So uh, the first game that we're going to check out is called Polestar. This is a Neo Geo game. Uh, still, I still have the Neo Geo board uh, inside the cabinet. Uh, this is Polestar. Polestar, I would say, borrows very heavily from R-Type. It's sort of like the Neo Geo's version of R-Type. The same way that like World Heroes is the Neo Geo's version 
of uh, Street Fighter 2. But uh, that doesn't mean that it's not a great game, uh, because it is. This, I'm playing this game on a 161 in one uh, bootleg cartridge. Uh, this is one that I don't actually own a, a real copy of, because uh, this game goes for about 350 bucks. Okay. Sorry, I should let you watch the cool intro sequence. So you can see when we start off, uh, the ship is real slow, but um, but you can pick up speed power ups, and uh, then you won't be so slow anymore. Uh, you can see it right in front of the ship there. You've got like a little shield thing that will actually get bigger, and uh, just like our type, uh, that part of your ship is invincible, but can also be used as a weapon. Oh boy. I missed that power up. It was homing missiles too, which would have been nice. So now you can see that that shield is getting way bigger. If you hit these guys right in the head, it kills them. One more, there you go. All right, see, so now the ship is getting quite a bit faster. So then you get like this little mini boss guy, but then he's got his little buddies down here. And if you don't watch it, they will shoot you. And then this this is this just looks kind of neat, but then you can actually blow up the tips of that thing. Uh, but then you can accidentally crash into it and die like a dumbass. I really just want to make it to the second stage if I can, just so you guys can see it. Uh, the second stage just it seems like it borrows a little bit more heavily from our type, uh, just like in terms of the enemies and whatnot. So I was in too much of a hurry to come kill this guy. Oh, I backed into that. I, I hate it. Like it's kind of a pet peeve of mine. Shooters where you can you can uh, crash into the walls. I mean, although all it really means is I should be paying attention. Now we got to the boss battle. What do I got? This is my last life though, right? That sucks. So first you gotta get rid of this little thing. There you go, he's gone. I timed it wrong. All right, what do you guys think? Can we do one continue? All right. Where's it going to make us continue, though? If it's the beginning of the level, then it's useless. No, it doesn't. All right, cool. I just want you guys to see the second level. Now we should be good.
All right, there we go. And he blows up. And I mean, that, that looks kind of cool. Like, that's not something you're going to see as much uh, on a home console. And you got to be careful because there's more things that you can crash into uh, in this. But see, like, these guys that come out, these scorpion guys, like, that's straight out of our type. I mean, look at that background, though, man. It looks so freaking good. Oh, man. I crashed into the... Crashed into the wall again. I think that's... I've died that way almost every time in this playthrough, right? Crashing into the wall. But that's okay. Like I said, I just wanted you guys to see this level. I tell you what, those graphics look more beautiful than anything I ever saw in our type. I what? I don't even know what shot me. Well, that's all right. Okay, so uh, that was Polestar. A uh, really cool game, to be sure. So uh, now we're going to pop in uh, hmm, at least one more Neo Geo game. Uh, and then after that, because I have three, yeah, three non-Neo Geo games. Three? Yeah, three non-Neo Geo games that uh, I want to play. So uh, I'm going to turn off the arcade cabinet. Uh, swap the game out, and then we'll get back to it. All right, so this next game is called Shock Troopers. Uh, certainly no stranger to anybody who's familiar with the Neo Geo library, uh, but probably not the first game that comes up in a conversation uh, with just casual gamers, you know, who think of the Neo Geo as, like, uh, Metal Slug and uh, all the various fighting games it has. But... Uh, <clears throat> but Shock Troopers really is an awesome, uh, sort of a traditional top-down uh, run-and-gun game. Of course, you can play two-player simultaneous, uh, which is awesome. Uh, there is also a Shock Troopers 2 on the Neo Geo, but uh, I don't have that one. I only have the first one. Although I probably have Shock Troopers 2 uh, on that 161 in one cartridge, but uh, I don't know that for a fact. Uh, so here is just explaining uh, the controls. Uh, there's really just three action buttons. Uh, a is for shoot, B you can roll, and C is for your special weapon. D does have a function though, and I'll show you that uh, right now. So at the player select screen here, you can choose between Lonely Wolf or Team Battle. And Lonely Wolf just basically means you have one character with three lives, but if you do Team Battle, you get to choose three different characters with uh, one life each, and that's what uh, we're going to do uh, here. 
So uh, then the D button switches between, uh, the, you can switch between those characters on the fly because uh, they of course all have different special weapons. So some might be better in, uh, in certain situations. As you can see there, you can choose the route that you take. Uh, it, I think, I've never looked this up, so I don't know, know it for a fact, but it, it seems like that route is sort of a difficulty setting in my opinion, because I think this mountain stage uh, is, uh, is the easiest. So with uh, right now we have the standard weapon. You see it just says normal. And uh, you have unlimited ammunition uh, when you're just using the standard weapon. But as you'll see, uh, really probably any minute now, uh, you can pick up uh, like better weapons. Like here, see it says heavy. So now we have like a heavy machine gun and now we have 200 rounds before it goes back to uh, just the regular one. Oh, damn it. Oh, here we can pick up more uh, heavy ammunition, so that's cool. And then I'll show you this guy's special weapon in a minute. Uh, he has, like, explosive boomerangs, which is pretty cool. Uh, yeah, I don't like the flame shot that much. I guess it's cool lighting your enemies on fire, but... And then, um... There you go. Uh, you can collect power-ups off of the enemies. Sometimes those power-ups are just point bonuses, and sometimes they're health bonuses. But the only way that they will drop those is if you kill the enemies with a knife. Which uh, is kind of interesting just because if you've ever played uh, Rambo 3 on the Genesis, which is the same style of game, uh, it operates the same way. So those little gems, those are just um, point bonuses. And you can also strafe, which is what I'm kind of doing now. But... Only if you hold down the fire button, which kind of sucks, but uh, I guess they didn't really have an extra button. But the, what sucks about that is that if you have uh, a limited use weapon like this one, the only way for me to maintain this angle is by holding down the fire button. So then you're just like wasting ammunition. So now I just ran out of ammo. Uh, so now I have to go back to just... Uh, the regular stuff. And I usually find the best time to try to hit, uh, kill guys with knives is when they're parachuting in. You can stab them, like, right when they land. Like that. Well, I guess he punches them instead of stabbing them. It depends on which character. But see, they start, you only have, like, a fraction of a second before they try to shoot you. Uh, ro I should mention rolling is important. Well, rolling's nice because you go a little bit faster, but you're also, it, you can dodge fire. Like, you can't get shot while you're rolling, so you just roll through the, roll through the shots there. All right, I think, yep, so this is the first boss. Get out of here. got him all right see and then he comes out but you can't you can shoot him but it doesn't do anything but so that's it so that's the first level of uh of shock troopers well that's pretty cool that guy is swole oh, things are getting a little bit rapey we don't need to watch that uh, all right, so now we're going to go uh, to the second stage. We can go ahead and we can switch characters if you want. Uh, I can show you how that works. Yeah, see, now now we're this other guy instead. Oh, we didn't need that. See, since that life bonus was there, I should have switched back to the other character real fast uh, before I picked it up. But, oh well.
So you see now we're scaling the side of a mountain, which is kind of cool. I find it's actually easiest if you stay uh, on one edge of the screen. So now we have to get on kind of like this zip line thing or something. See, and then instead of rolling, you do that jump and then uh, same thing, like the shots won't hit you when those bullets go by. Some people criticized the graphics of this game. So I should mention this game came out in... Uh, 97 so you know by this time I would say most Neo Geo games probably looked a little bit better than this, but um, You know obviously now it's 2020 and so like You know does it really you know, we're not playing this game sort of in the context of the year it came out so uh, Like I think it looks you know pretty good. It's just it looks better than like really early Neo Geo games, but to be sure, like it, it doesn't look as good as like some of the Metal Slug games, later Metal Slug games. But you know, the gameplay is really good and uh, that's what counts. All right, boss battle time, I think. Oh, yeah. Switching characters just because uh, he was getting low on ammo there, or low on health rather. Plus, she's got a bazooka. That's pretty cool. Look at that. All right, there you go. So we haven't. We got two characters low on health now, but uh, nobody's died yet. So that's cool. Oh, whoops, wrong one. All right, I'll go back to boomerang having guy here. Oh, the, I like the graphics in this level get really cool just because of all the fire effects. See, I just picked up a speed up. Those are um, those are pretty rare. All right, that. We pick up that meat, you get a lot of health back when you get that meat, so that's helpful. Another health bonus. I should have should have switched characters for that, but The three-way shot, um, not my favorite, but it's not bad. Get out of here. Oh, this is a cool, the buster. I don't even know what, I don't even know what you call that. It's just awesome. I don't know why there's forklifts in here, but. I 
I don't know how well you can hear the music uh, over the microphone there, but uh, this level has, I mean, this game in general has good music, but I think it's pretty exceptional uh, in this area. And for some reason, the game gets always gets quiet here for just a second. But like this, I know this area has kind of like a Terminator, two, like end of the movie of Terminator Two kind of vibe to it. Uh, I'm gonna stick with the uh, Vulcan there. All right, I guess I, I guess I didn't. So that bomb thing that refills uh, our special weapon. I think we got another boss battle coming up. Oh yeah, this is like this. Yeah. Oh, what? That really didn't work out in our favor at all. Oh, she's dead. He's dead, too. And he's almost dead, so I think this is probably where we're going to check out. Oh, nope. All right, we have a sliver of life. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Now, oh, yeah, all right, he got us. I forgot. Then he jumps out, and then you can kill him. But, uh, all right, so that was one credit of uh, Shock Troopers. Again, pretty cool game, uh, in my opinion. So now we're going to switch it out again. For, uh, I don't really, oh, I know what. All right, oh, I got it, I got it. All right, so this last Neo Geo game we're gonna check out is Strikers 1945 Plus. And, uh, you know, it would have been easy just to play uh, a King of Fighters game or some Metal Slug, but I just thought it would be cool to play things that are sort of like off the beaten path a little bit uh, on the Neo Geo. Uh, Strikers 1945 Plus is um, maybe kind of not well regarded by a lot of arcade purists because if you actually get a Strikers 1945 board, uh, that is a, a game where I'd have to rotate the monitor. So you know, it's a it's a three four vertically scrolling shooter, and so when you're playing it on the Neo Geo, uh, as you can kind of see, uh, it's it's shrunk down. They put like status bars on each side. And, uh, and shrink the game down. But the, the gameplay is still really solid. It's just that the, the field of view is shrunk down a little bit, but um, uh, I still really like it. And you know, I, I like games that don't force me to have to um, rotate my monitor because uh, I don't want to do that. There we go. Okay. Let me see if I can remember. If you go over here. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Oh, I forgot. There's a um, there's a code right there to unlock a, a a plane, and I thought I knew it, but I guess I forgot it. One cool thing about this game is that it randomizes the order of the levels. So, um, and it's funny because I think that just inherently some levels are harder than others, and so. Uh, you know, your particular gameplay experience with a, with a game or, you know, with an individual game is going to vary based on the order it put the levels in. Um, you know, it makes the levels harder based on the order, you know, as far as like number of foes and whatnot. But I just think, like I said, I think inherently, like some of the levels just are harder than others. And so if you get lucky and, you know, get uh, sort of a good randomized order, you can get farther uh, in the game. So uh, one thing you get in this game, you get uh, super shots. Like, so you have, you have your bombs, but you also have super shots that just charge up by, you know, you shooting things. So like here, that that's a super shot, but this super shot is not really all that helpful uh, against bosses. I shouldn't use that right there, but um, 
And like, so some, depending on which plane you pick, uh, some super shots are more powerful than others, but, oh man, but uh, usually it's like, if your plane has weaker power shots, they charge up faster and you can have a higher maximum number of them. Oh man. There we go. Uh, the other thing you might notice, the levels in this game are really short. Like it's like, you know, 45 seconds of level and then here comes the boss. Which that I kind of don't care for just because like I enjoy the game. And so like I would rather have the levels be uh, a little bit longer. I wish I hadn't chosen this plane. I might pump another quarter into this one or another 100 yen coin rather and uh, pick a different plane. And you always want to pick up the gold bars uh, to get points, just because that's even if you're not playing the game for high score, uh, that's how you get extra lives. Oh, no, that was close. Obviously, you can also see the bullets are pink, which I, you know, pink's not necessarily my favorite color, but um, it makes it helpful because, you know, they're easier to see. Not all the bullets are pink. Some of them are blue, but like with Polestar, you know, you can easily get hit, I would say, by bullets that you didn't even see because they just sort of faded into the background. But I think there's not really any way that's going to happen uh, with this game. Oh, damn it. That's game over. All right, so I'm going to... I'm not going to continue because I want to... I want to try and um, see if I can get that secret plane. I don't know why it keeps spitting out my coins. It just doesn't like some of them. There we go. I guess I forgot it. All right, well, whatever. Pancake. That was up, down, up, down, then seven ups and a down. So you can see the pancake here is way faster, which I like. But like you can see now, it started us off on a different level. But you can see the pancake also only has three super shots. And you can see over there that uh, I have all three super shots and the meter is full, which means that if I don't use one, uh, you know, it, it's kind of like a waste. And this, this plane has a much better super shot. Good for bosses, but also good for sort of like sweeping enemies off the screen. watch so when you use your bomb it, it uh, you see it called up that flying wing but uh, you can hide behind it like it shields you uh, from enemy fire which is really helpful Man, we killed each other. So 
So you can see as the levels progress, like now there's just there's just sort of more stuff going on uh, on the screen. I'm dead. All right, that's game over. All right, so that's it for the three Neo Geo games. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and turn the cameras off because now I have to actually change the board uh, inside the cabinet. So I'll be back in just a second. All right, so now we're moving on to Capcom CPS games and uh, I have two to play. Uh, the first one, we're not gonna use the extra button harness and then I'll have to put in the button harness when we switch to the second game. Uh, this first game, I would say, uh, needs no introduction, and that is Final Fight. And uh, I went through and I set the dip switches uh, to try to, like, you know, replicate what it would be like if you walked up to the cab in an arcade, like, made sure that the difficulty setting was set to normal. But uh, for some reason, uh, I guess I got one of the switches wrong because it wants uh, two coins to start the game instead of one. There's one, and see now it says insert additional coin. So normally it would just be set for, for one coin and we wouldn't have to do this. There we go. Um, I don't know why I feel the need to say this, but uh, uh, I'll just reiterate, uh, I'm not really that good at this game. Final Fight to me is a much more difficult game than like the Streets of Rage series. Uh, oh, I didn't want to be Cody. Well, that's all right. Um, well, there's nothing we can do about it now, but, um... I don't know, does he just play like, uh, Guy? I guess so. Uh, from what I'm told, the easiest character to use is, uh, Hagger, the, the big swole guy. But, um, I don't know, he's just so big and slow that I don't think that the game is, is quite as fun. Uh, I noticed the volume is a lot louder on this game than it was on the Neo Geo, so hopefully it sounds a little bit better. I think the sound was a little bit too quiet uh, for the Neo Geo games. I don't, I don't need that. So I'm gonna try to leave that hamburger sitting there in case I take some damage from one of these guys. All right, cool. Uh, no damage so far and then um, sometimes I, I don't do well in this little basement area and I'll get killed. Uh, and that sucks because once you get out of this basement area, right at the top of the stairs, uh, there is a, uh, big health pickup. All right, we're all right. Uh, the, fir the first boss battle is where, for me, things definitely uh, go off the rails. So, yeah, so you got that big piece of meat and then a pipe. Uh, there's There'll be different weapons there. Uh, sometimes there's like a samurai sword, uh, which is also a really good weapon. There we go. And then uh, that's the level one boss. And you see how huge he is. Uh, I haven't played the Super Nintendo version of Final Fight probably since I made that uh, Super Nintendo in 1991 video, but at least my memory is that that boss is a lot smaller uh, in the Super Nintendo version, which which would make sense. lost our first life. Well, the other thing I did is I changed it so we get three lives, which I would say is standard, but uh, when I checked all the dip switch settings, uh, when I got this game down off the shelf, it was set for two lives. Let's see, we just lost another life there, so. But we've almost got this guy. There we go, all right, so 
Uh, like I said, not too good at this game, but um, at least we made it out of the first round. Uh, and then here coming up soon, uh, one of the things I would say this game is just sort of, uh, you know, known for, I guess you'd say, uh, uh, is the the character, or the enemy character, uh, Andore. Uh, I think he's Andore Jr. Well, I think there's Andore regulars later in the game, but I think you start off with Andore Juniors, who's just like clearly a ripoff uh, of Andre the Giant. And uh, he's coming up pretty soon. All right, that's like a that's like a small health pickup. Oh yeah, there he is. All right, so you gotta watch it. These these guys will really mess you up. Oh yeah. Oh boy. Yep, he killed us. All right, so now we're already down to our last life. I feel like Cody plays a lot like Guy. I mean, somebody that's really into Final Fight will will leave a comment and tell me how. Cody and Guy are different, but uh, they feel the same to me compared to playing uh, with Hagger, who is obviously quite a bit different. Okay, so now I think, yeah, we're going to go into the subway car. But, you know, playing this game, I mean, you can, you know, maybe if you haven't played one of the home versions in a while, it's not quite as obvious, but, you know, you can clearly see that the graphics... Uh, are more detailed uh, in this arcade version, as you would expect. But to be quite honest, uh, I would say that the home versions of this game are actually quite impressive. No, you don't. Just trying to see if I can make it to a health power up, but I don't think there's one coming up that soon. See, it's telling you to go, but you don't want to go because all that's going to happen is this guy's going to follow us and then some more dudes are going to show up. So even though the game is trying to hurry you along, uh, don't fall for it. See, and you see this guy blocks your shots, which kind of sucks. trying to last as long as I can since we're on our last life here. Plus, I don't know, uh, well, we got an extra life at 100,000, and I think the way the dip switches are set, I don't think I get another one until 300,000, which I feel like I'm not going to still be alive. Uh, that's about uh, 80,000 points away almost. But we'll try. These guys really don't want to give up the fight. There we go. See, if we get to the end of the car, yeah, here, there's a health bonus in here somewhere, but... There we go. Oh, man. There's another one.
All right. All right. This I didn't think we were going to make it this far, especially after we lost uh, two lives to the first boss. This is like, it's funny playing these games now as an adult because, you know, when I was a kid, I would have my pocket full of quarters or tokens or whatever, you know, and for me to get off the first stage of any arcade game uh, when I was a kid was an accomplishment in and of itself. Ooh, there we go. You jerk. It's funny how many, like, you know, movements are... There's, like, movements that, that are similar between Final Fight and uh, uh, Streets of Rage. And there's also some characters that are fairly similar. And uh, I don't remember what year Final Fight came out in the arcade. Like, I want to say 89, but I feel like that's wrong. Ah, I didn't even get a hit in on that guy. Uh, all right, well, anyway, uh, that's Final Fight. So uh, that's pretty grim. Uh, anyway, so uh, next I'm going to have to, you know, turn off the arcade machine again, obviously, because we're going to switch to another CPS game that uh, is gonna require us to use the extra button harness. So I'll be back in just a second. All right, so I've popped in the other Capcom CPS board. So I had to go, uh, well, I was already down underneath there putting the board in. I put in the little uh, extra button adapter to go from the board uh, to that amp up connector that the Astro City uses. And then I put the extra button harness uh, in the control panel, although I only bothered wiring up uh, player one for uh, for obvious reasons. So uh, the game we've got here is Street Fighter II. Uh, well, it's a, a Champion Edition board, but it's been upgraded to uh, Turbo Hyper Fighting. So uh, for people who don't know, uh, Street Fighter II Turbo Hyper Fighting is just a Street Fighter II Champion Edition board with three of the ROM chips upgraded. So like that's how it was sold back in the day is arcade operators could just buy these upgrade kits that would just convert Champion Edition into Turbo Hyper Fighting. So like if I wanted to play just regular Champion Edition, all I would have to do is put those three ROM chips on the board, uh, you know, back to stock and I could play it uh, that way. So uh, I think this one is also set up like it wants two coins. Yeah, it wants two coins. I don't, um, I don't really get it because the dip switch settings shouldn't be set for that. But uh, I don't know, maybe, the, maybe my A board here is dying too. Uh, I mean, I hope not, but uh, now I'm getting a slew of unwanted coins again. Uh, this is the only Capcom uh, CPS A board that I have left that works. I have three CPS games and I have to swap them all onto the same A board, uh, which drives me crazy. I wish that somebody would make uh, replacement A boards, but that would not be easy. But, uh, you know, with the FPGA technology we have now, I think we'd be able to. So uh, I always play as, as Ryu. I feel like, you know, to use the parlance of millennials, that's very basic. But uh, that's just, you know, when I started playing Street Fighter 2, you know, back in like 1992, uh, I don't, for whatever reason, I picked Ryu. And I've never really uh, moved off of that, so... Uh, you know, I've said many times, this is my, you know, Street Fighter 2 is my favorite uh, fighting game. Uh, that does not mean uh, that I'm very good at it. Oh, that's going to hurt. I'm especially not good at uh, at Street Fighter 2 Turbo. It For me, it's like too fast. I guess I could just get used to it, but uh, it's too fast. But the only other uh, Street Fighter 2 board that I have is the original Street Fighter 2, uh, the World Warrior. And I just figured that it would be cooler to show this one instead. I mean, this is sort of the most refined version of, of sort of the original uh, Street Fighter 2 before you got into uh, 
uh, Super Street Fighter 2. But, you know, I, I wish... I, I would love to have a version of the game that had the refinements of Street Fighter 2 Turbo uh, without the fast speed. So that was kind of good. All right, we got a perfect. I think with home versions of, of Street Fighter 2 Turbo, you could actually turn off the turbo. But uh, this this board does not... There's no, like, dip switch setting that will, will let you turn turbo off. So... Uh, you're just kind of stuck with it. So you can tell I like fireballs. But, you know, why would I get up close to this guy if I can just stay back here and... There we go. All right. Not bad. Not good either, but, you know... He kicked our butts out of the gate, so I'm glad we were able to come back a little bit. Um, hopefully we can fight Chun-Li, just so then you can see... Uh, in, uh, in Street Fighter 2 Turbo, Chun-Li can, can throw fireballs for anybody who didn't know that. Uh, maybe to make, I think it was, you know, they did things to this game to uh, kind of balance it out a little bit. And so I wonder if that wasn't one of those things. Like maybe, um, maybe Chun-Li was, was kind of considered uh, under, too underpowered. I don't know that for a fact, I'm just guessing. Because why else would they, why else would they give her that ability? Oh. Time had run out too. I guess, like for me, I, I consider myself to be very bad at this game because uh, I used to every once in a while I'd go over to the Bay Area and I'd hang out with these guys who, like you know, they all have arcade cabinets in their house. And I mean, these guys were maybe you know approaching uh, you know competition levels of skill. So I also hate that I, why do I have to wear like the secondary uh, uh, outfit or uniform or whatever? Like I'm the one that paid to play the game. Like the computer Ryu should be wearing the, the blue gi. Oh, <laughs> I'm very bad uh, against Ryu, so... Wasn't it the case, uh, maybe I'm misremembering, I could swear it was the case with the original World Warrior that you didn't have to fight yourself, but did I just make that up? Get away from me. See, he throws a lot of fireballs too, so I don't know why I feel guilty about it. Well, that's game over, but uh, but that's all right anyway. So uh, that is Street Fighter Two, Turbo Hyper Fighting. Uh, I would really like to get the ROM chips to uh, turn it back into uh, Street Fighter Two Champion Edition. Uh, and then, if you notice, uh, this is an Asian uh, uh, board, so it's like for the Asian market. So when I first boot up the the arcade cab, it even says like not for sale outside of like Japan or something like that. So that's why uh, a lot of the text is uh, not in English and we won't bother putting in uh, our initials there. So we have just one game left and uh, this game is not JAMA compatible. So uh, I have to use a little adapter board in order to play it. Uh, the home version of this game is one of my all time favorite games. So uh, see if you 
can guess what I'm talking about uh, when we boot up the next game. All right, William Session says, please don't do drugs. And it is, of course, Golden Axe. Uh, so I checked the dip switches, uh, dip switches on this one uh, just to make sure that, um, you know, everything was on uh, standard, standard difficulty uh, and whatnot. So for people who don't know, uh, arcade PCBs have like banks of switches on them. And uh, you can use those switches to adjust all kinds of different parameters. And one of those parameters is the difficulty of the game. And uh, the reason for uh, changing that, like let's say for instance that you were the manager of like a Chuck E. Cheese, right? So it was gonna be like little kids playing your games. You would probably wanna dial back the difficulty or you know, you'd probably end up getting parents complaining uh, on the flip side, uh, you know, if you were maybe uh, an arcade operator that was maybe being a little bit greedy or just depending on the nature of your clientele, uh, you might want to bump up the difficulty to something a little bit harder. Uh, and if you're just being greedy, that would be so that somebody's money wouldn't last as long. So they'd have to either pump in more quarters or they would get off the cabinet so that somebody else could get in there. Uh, or maybe if you just had an older clientele that that wanted uh, that little bit of extra difficulty, uh, you could do that. So uh, let's go ahead and pump in. Oh, didn't like that one. There we go. I really got to get this thing dialed in. So, uh, you know, same as, same as the Genesis version, we have the three playable characters. Uh, I just always play uh, as Gilly as Thunderhead. That's been the way it's been. Uh, I think even the first time I ever played Golden Axe, uh, which was at a round table pizza parlor, uh, I picked Gilius Thunderhead. And uh, I don't really know what what made me sort of gravitate towards him. Uh, whoops, that was the wrong button. Um, because, you know, I had never seen uh, a movie that I can think of uh, that would have had dwarves in it. I mean, what, what fantasy movies had dwarves in them like before the Lord of the Rings trilogy? Uh, I'm not saying that there wasn't one. I'm just saying I don't, I don't know what that would be. I feel like when I played this game, I probably thought it was neat uh, just because I had already seen Willow and it's sort of at least set in the same kind of world. And I mean, who knows? I guess, you know, I don't, I never thought of Willow as being a, a, a dwarf, at least in the same way as uh, Gilius here, but I guess technically, uh, I mean, isn't that what the actor is? He's a dwarf? I'm not really sure. Hopefully this is not too loud. Um, the volume is I, I cranked up the volume a little bit just because, I mean, you know, it's Golden Axe. But um, this, this was actually the first arcade PCB that I ever bought. And I bought this a few years before, uh, before I got this arcade cabinet. And the reason I did that is that one year for Secret Santa on uh, one of the forums... Somebody gave me, my friend Todd actually gave me uh, a super gun. Uh, he gave me a super gun along with a, with a PGM and one or two games, I don't remember which. And I mean, I don't have the PGM anymore, but uh, I do still have the super gun. But so I'm saying as soon as I got that super gun, I felt like, well, now I can play arcade boards, uh, you know, just on, uh, on my PVM. So, uh, so this was the first one that I got. And uh, I mean, I certainly don't remember what I paid for it. Uh, I don't remember it being too bad because again, this was several years ago. And uh, what, am I, what am I doing? Here we go. But uh, you know, for anybody that's seen it over on the other channel, you know, I did the video. Uh, I did the video all about Golden Axe. I don't, I think it was called like the history of Golden Axe or something like that. Uh, although it really wasn't that much of a historical perspective, but um, but the, the footage in that video uh, of the arcade version was made using uh, this PCB. So, uh, I mean, I don't know why that matters, but I guess that was kind of cool. Um, it was a fun video to make. Oh, I keep hitting the wrong button. Which is funny because the buttons, it's the same button assignments as the, the home version. So, uh, I've said before, I don't remember where, like maybe on a magazine read-through or something, that I actually prefer the Genesis version 
uh, to this version. And uh, I mean, this version certainly looks better. And um, I mean, I don't know. Some of the sounds are better. I mean, these screams, I forgot. These screams kind of like came out of like Rambo or something. I forgot. Like these screams were ripped off from a, from a movie. But um, I think they sound kind of cheesy. But uh, the only reason I don't like this game as much as the Genesis version is that it just, uh, like Gilius, he just handles a lot more slowly. Like you see, you, you really can't pull off the combo that fast. And um, so I don't know, but I mean, it's still a good version. I'm not trying to say that it's not. I mean, obviously I like it or I wouldn't keep it. I mean, for me, like how, what fun is it to, you know, to be able to actually play uh, Golden Axe in my arcade machine? So, um, so yeah, like I said, I, I, I think it's good, but, um, you know, I, I've been playing the Genesis version since I was a teenager. So, you know, it just has more of a special place in my heart. I just remember the first time I played this game when I was a kid at the pizza parlor, I just remember thinking that it was really, really hard. But, you know, I would have been, you know, this game came out in 89. So I would have been like, you know, 11 or 12. And, uh, you know, I wasn't really that good at games. And, um, you know, I hadn't really played that many beat em ups. You know, I think at that time, boy, we're not doing too well. Oh, we're, oh it's over already? All right, one more, one more. Uh, at that time, the only other beat em up I can really think of. Uh, that I had played was uh, was Double Dragon. You know, because this would have been before... Well, I don't... Actually, I shouldn't say. What year did Final Fight come out? Well, in any case, I hadn't played it yet. And, you know, I just feel like home beat-em-ups kind of took off more uh, during uh, the 16-bit days. I don't think I should have used that yet. Yeah, I definitely should have saved that for skeleton guy here. Oh, how dare you. No, get away. Uh, generally, um, I, I guess I should have said this earlier, but you know, uh, generally the home versions of games were easier, like they would dial back the difficulty. Uh, you know, versus, uh, didn't mean to do that, but that's okay. Uh, versus the arcade version. So, you know, that, so that's one thing is I'm just kind of used to this game being a little bit easier. That being said, this, this arcade version of Golden Axe is not terribly difficult. Uh, you know, with a little bit of practice, I'd say you could, you could get pretty good at it quite easily. But, you know, part of that, I think, is, um, kind of getting used to the, the way that the characters handle uh, just because it is different. Like, a lot of the strategies are, are the same, but... Oh, man. It's funny, I got caught between those guys, and I found myself trying to push two buttons at the same time. Uh, because, you know, I just got finished playing uh, Final Fight. And so I was trying to do, like, the little spinny move, you know, but it's like, oh, wrong game. Well, that would have been cool. I mean, you can do that, which I guess I could have done. Never been a really big fan of the chicken leg, so I don't usually hop on those guys. I was going to eat it on that jump. One thing about these uh, Sanwa buttons versus like, um, you know, versus like American uh, HAP controls is uh, they're a lot more sensitive. So you you just have to, oh, you're a butthole. I th do I have this thing set to two lives or something? All right, one more, one more. Yeah. Um, uh, like you only have to like barely touch it. So it's just, it's kind of something you have to get used to. Like, it's not really, uh, at least for me, and maybe I'm just heavy handed, but uh, it's not a good idea to keep my fingers like resting on the buttons because you'll accidentally hit them. 
And I think you can actually put heavier springs in these buttons. I thought I saw an option on one of the websites where you could buy uh, heavier springs. Or or maybe it was that Saimitsu buttons have heavier springs than Sanwa. Uh, I don't really remember. I don't, want, I don't want that guy anywhere near me. What does that say in the back? The beer garden. That's cool. It says the beer garden, Sega. I would, uh, I wouldn't mind having a sign of that uh, down here in the basement. All right, cool. Everybody knows why that's important. At least if you've been watching the show for a while. the dudes come rising up out of the ground. I would say that I hate these skeleton guys, but uh, but who doesn't? It's funny, when, when I did that Golden Axe video, uh, so many people left comments complaining that I didn't show the special move where you like jump up in the air and then and then do that. But it's because I never use it. Like, I think it's useless. Maybe I'm just not good at it, but like, going like that and then... You know, you're up in... Your your hang time is so high that, that uh, uh, you know, the guy just moves out of the way. Uh, anyway, I mean, that's, that's three coins, so that's a lot. We broke the rules big time on that one. But um, that's Golden Axe, and that is my Sega Astro City. So what was that, like probably a two hour video? I don't really know. But uh, as always, thanks for watching. We'll see you guys next time.